Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today we're returning to the wonderful world of Dr. Joseph Murphy and the law of protection in a chapter called The Dynamic Law of Protection from the Amazing Laws of Cosmic Mind Power. This chapter is amazing. It covers the concept of God as love and the importance of forgiveness and overcoming hate all of these things being powerful, transformative bits of knowledge which will change your life in that unique Joseph Murphy way. The Dynamic Law of Protection by Joseph Murphy. Some time ago, I was asked to visit a woman named Gloria W., who was being treated for cancer at the Sloan Kettering Institute in New York. When I asked about her family, she told me she had one son and two grandchildren but she never saw them. Why is that, I wondered. Do they live far away? No. They're an hour away in Connecticut, she replied. I never see them. Because if I did, I'd have to see my son's wife too. I'm puzzled, I asked. Your daughter-in-law? My son's wife, she repeated, deliberately rejecting the term I had suggested. Her face hardened. I hate that little snip. I've hated her like poison since the accused day my son brought her home. I can't imagine what he saw in her. I can only pray that his eyes are open before it's too late. How long have your son and his wife been married, I asked. Gloria thought for a moment, then said, almost 30 years, and my feeling about her has grown stronger inside me every year. Like your cancer, I remarked. She stared at me. What do you mean by that, she demanded. Have you asked your doctors what caused your disease, I replied. If you strip away the technicalities, they probably said that some of your own cells have turned against you, have become poisonous. I'd like to suggest that in another sense, the destructive emotions you've harbored toward your daughter-in-law have had a toxic effect on you. Not only on your mind and heart, but on the very cells of your body. Do you want to be cured of your cancer? Of course I do, she burst out. More than anything, more than your negative feelings about your daughter-in-law, I probed. After a brief hesitation, she nodded. Then you must give them up. You must teach yourself to practice the great art of forgiveness. You must begin by wholeheartedly, sincerely, and lovingly praying for your daughter-in-law. Later in our encounter, I helped Gloria compose this prayer about her daughter-in-law. The peace of God fills her soul. She is inspired and blessed in all her ways. God is prospering her, and I rejoice that the law of God is working for her, through her, and all around her. I feel in my heart and soul that I have released her. Whenever the thought of her enters my mind, I wish her well. I am now free. Gloria's spirit of forgiveness, together with the chemotherapy and other treatments she received, brought about a remarkable change in her personality, and a wonderful healing took place. Her prayer changed her subconscious mind by eliminating and neutralizing all the negative patterns lodged therein, and its embodiment also had to disappear. A new concept of God works wonders. A few months ago, I was invited to visit a very kind man named Milton S. I knew him to be noble, generous, and magnanimous in every way. On my first evening as his guest, he told me that he had recently been diagnosed with prostate cancer. My father and uncle both died of prostate cancer, he added. For 20 years or more, I've lived with the fear of developing it myself. I don't think a day has passed when I didn't pray to be spared this trial. Clearly, my prayers did not find favor with God. It's just as Job said, the thing I greatly feared has come upon me. Old friend, I said, forgive me, but I think your prayers have been misaddressed. What you've been doing is begging some far-off God, saying, if it is God's will... He will heal me. If not, he will inflict some dread disease on me. This is nothing more than the primitive concept of an avenging God punishing his children. God dwells in each one of us because you believed yourself to be the likely victim of cancer by God's will. It was as if you willed it to happen, and so it did. If this is so, Milton asked, what must I do to be saved? Believe that your condition will be cured. I replied, be of good cheer. Approach the treatment your physician prescribes with the conviction that God wills them to be effective. 
Feel the cure in your heart and your subconscious mind will respond accordingly. Later, I received word from Milton that his prostate cancer was in remission and his general health, both physical and spiritual, had never been better. Why she had no boyfriends? Angie was a young woman from rural Wyoming who was working in an office in Los Angeles. She came to me after a public lecture and said, Do you think you can help me? I'm so shy and timid that I blush and turn away if a fellow even says hello to me. I never learned how to get along with guys. I think maybe I never will. But you want to, I probed. Oh, more than anything, she exclaimed. I hate being single and lonely. I want to make someone happy. I want a family of my own. After we talked a bit longer, I explained to her how to realize her desires. The starting point was to abandon her view of herself as timid and withdrawn. She had to make herself feel that she was admired, wanted, and cared for. At my suggestion, she bought a diary at a stationery store and started to fill it with counts of dates with imaginary admirers. Every evening, she set aside a time to meditate on the details of these encounters, which were always positive and fulfilling. Soon she found that speaking to people at work was no longer so threatening to her. When a group of co-workers invited her to go along to a restaurant on a Friday evening, she accepted. One of them, a young man she had long admired from afar, spent the whole evening flirting and chatting with her. At the end of the evening, he asked to see her again. She soon became immensely popular with men and was no longer a wallflower. As her romantic life began to flourish, Anne realized that she now wanted something more lasting. She began to affirm and claim that infinite intelligence was attracting to her an ideal companion. Who would harmonize with her perfectly? She imagined a wedding ring on her finger as she went to sleep at night. She would mentally touch and feel the ring. She actualized the state and impregnated her subconscious mind by feeling the naturalness, solidity, and tangibility of the ring. Moreover, she told herself the ring implied the marriage was already consummated and that she was resting in the accomplished fact. She soon attracted a wonderful man. Today, they blend harmoniously in every way. How he became a superior student. I'm terribly worried about my son, David Kay told me. He's just 11, but I'm afraid his future is very bleak. His teacher recently told me he thought Sam would be evaluated for a learning disability. There was talk of transferring him to a special education class. I know very well what that means. It's a polite way of saying he is learning disabled. What do you think, I asked. Could his teacher be correct? David shifted uncomfortably in his chair. I hate to even think such a thing. But since that conference, I've been watching Sam very carefully. Sometimes he doesn't seem to hear what I say. And when I ask about his schoolwork, his responses come so slowly. It's as if it isn't penetrating his head. What line of work are you in, David? I asked. I'm an advertising copywriter, he replied. Suppose the head of your department was secretly half convinced that you were a flop, I said. Suppose he kept looking over your shoulder and asking you casual questions about your assignments. What effect do you think that would have? I'd fall flat on my face in no time, David said. Oh, I see what you're getting at. The way I've been watching Sam is really sabotaging him. The same with his teacher. Anything that seems like a problem gets noticed more. That is a lot of it, I said. But there's more your conscious belief that your son may be mentally disabled communicates itself to your subconscious and to Sam's. That helps bring about the very thing you fear. That's awful, David said. I don't want to harm Sam. I want to help him. But what can I do? You must change your conscious beliefs, I told him. Go someplace quiet, relax your body and mind, and lose yourself in the joy of hearing your boy tell you how well he's doing in school. Do this three or four times a day. Visualize him handing you a semester report with glowing comments from the teacher. Feel the solidity of the form in your hand. See the black letters on the white surface. Hear yourself saying, Wow, Sam, great work. Keep it up. David adopted this advice. He immersed himself in this imagery until it penetrated his subconscious and became a living conviction. 
His son responded beautifully and blossomed forth as one of the best students in his class. The father experienced the fruit of the idea on which he had meditated. The father's prayer caused the intelligence and wisdom of the subconscious to well up in the mind of the boy, and he fulfilled his father's conviction of him. He could not be shot. A few years ago, I gave a series of lectures in Osaka, Japan. One evening in the restaurant of my hotel, I got into a conversation with a Japanese man named Akiro Ai. He told me he had served in the Imperial Army during World War II. This was in China, he said. A fellow soldier who disliked me accused me of something I hadn't done. The court-martial did not believe me. I was sentenced to be shot. How terrifying, I said. How did you escape the sentence? I should tell you that as a boy I was sent to a Christian school, he replied. In prison, some heavenly impulse made me keep repeating to myself the words of the 91st Psalm. Then, each night before I went to sleep, I said to my profound self, I cannot be shot. I am God's child, and God cannot shoot himself. I knew there is but one power and one life. My life was God's life. Akira told me that a few days before he was scheduled to be executed, he was released with no explanation and ordered back to duty. He never learned why he had been spared, but he was convinced that he had written his freedom in his subconscious mind by reiterating the truths of the psalm and by picturing his freedom. Whatever you impregnate your subconscious with, it responds accordingly. Your answer determines your future. When I was a boy at family gatherings, I used to hear my uncles and aunts talking about many things. Often they would say, you know, John or Mary met with that accident because he or she ceased going to church. Whenever any calamity came to people, they knew somehow they always found a reason to consider the victim sinful and the object of the wrath of God. Even as a child, I often wondered what kind of a God they had in their minds. What is your concept of God? Do you know that the answer you give to that question inevitably determines your entire future? Your belief about God is your belief about yourself. If you think that God is cruel, vindictive, and inscrutable, tyrannical, cannibalistic, Moloch in the skies, a sort of despot whose goal is to punish you, of course you will experience the result of this habitual thinking. Your life will be hazy, confused, and full of fear, and limitations of all kinds. In other words, you will experience the results of the nature of your belief about God. You will actually have negative experiences because of your belief. God becomes to you whatever you consider Him to be. Above all things, get the right concept of God. It makes no difference what you call God. You may call Him Allah, Brahma, Vishnu, Reality, Infinite Intelligence, the Healing Presence, the Oversoul, Divine Mind, the Architect of the Universe, the Supreme Being, the Life Principle, the Living Spirit, the Universe, or the Creative Power. The point is, your belief or conviction about God governs and gives direction to your whole life. Believe in a God of love. Millions of people believe in a God who sends sickness, pain, and suffering. They believe in a cruel and vindictive deity. They do not have a good God, and then to them, God is not a loving God. Having such weird, ignorant concepts of God, they experience the result of their beliefs in the form of all kinds of difficulties and troubles. Your subconscious mind manifests your beliefs and projects them as experiences, conditions, and events. Your nominal belief about God is meaningless. The thing that matters is your real subconscious belief, the belief of your heart. You will always demonstrate your belief. That is why Dr. Quimby said, more than a century ago, man is belief expressed. Millions of people conceive of a God of caprice, far off in the skies, who possesses all the whims of a human being. With such a concept, they are like the business executive who once told me I would be all right if God just left me alone. Believe that God is love, that he watches over you and cares for you, that he guides and prospers and loves you. Wonders will happen in your life that will far exceed your fondest dreams. Becoming a new person. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. 
the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 6. Begin now, today, as you read these lines, to enthrone the true concept or belief about God, and miracles will begin to happen in your life. Realize and know that God is all bliss, joy, indescribable beauty, absolute harmony, infinite intelligence, and boundless love, and that He is omnipotent, supreme, and the only presence. Accept mentally that God is all these things, as unhesitatingly as you accept the fact that you are alive. Then you will begin to experience in your life the wonderful results of your new conviction about the blessed God within you. You will find your health, your vitality, your business, your environment, and the world in general changing for the better. You'll begin to prosper spiritually, mentally, and materially. Your understanding and spiritual insight will grow in a wonderful way and you will find yourself transformed into a new person. His business prospered 300%. Philo L. came to speak to me after a lecture in London, England. I have lived with a deathly fear of poverty all my life, he admitted. I work very hard, but my affairs do not flourish. What can I do? Can you bring yourself to look upon God as your silent partner? I asked. As your guide and counselor? Believe that God always watches over you like a loving parent. Claim boldly that God is supplying all your needs and inspiring you in everything you do. His face brightened. How marvelous, he said. I never thought of God that way before. Always, he was distant. Awesome presence, but even a very stiff, dignified person unbends when he plays with his child. Perhaps it is the same with God. Philo wrote me a few months later, I feel God is a living presence, a friend, a counselor, and a guide. He said, my business has prospered 300%. My health is better, and I have thrown away the thick lenses I wore for 20 years. You can see what happened when this man decided to look upon God as his father. The word father meant something to him. It meant love, protection, guidance, and supply. Let wonders happen the same way in your life. The miracle of three steps. In the course of my ministry, I performed the marriage ceremony for a wonderful young couple, Janet and Bill S., in the Midwest. After about a month, however, they separated. Janet returned to her parents' home. What had happened to their romance? When I asked Bill that question, he said, we should never have stayed here. Where we both grew up, Janet was too popular. Practically every guy in our high school class was in love with her. Even before the wedding, I kept thinking she would start seeing other men. I was jealous of her. I did not trust her. I imagined that she was with some of her former boyfriends. I was sure I would lose her. By imagining evil about his wife, Bill was cohabiting mentally with fear, jealousy, and loss. He had already broken his marriage vows. He had promised to cherish love and honor her at all times and forsaking all others to remain faithful to her alone. Instead, he embraced his own mistrust. His fear communicated itself to the subconscious mind of his wife. So it came to pass that what he feared and believed actually took place. Hurt and baffled by his attitude, Janet looked for sympathy and comfort with an old male friend who still hoped to win her over. When Bill saw his belief made manifest, he blamed his wife. In truth, however, it was done unto him as he believed. It was my pastoral duty to explain all this to Bill and Janet. Once they learned about the workings of their conscious and subconscious minds, they decided to pray together and to practice the miracle of three steps. The first step, in the beginning, God. The moment they awakened in the morning, they claimed God was guiding them in all their ways. They sent out loving thoughts of peace, harmony, and joy to each other and to the whole world. The second step, grace at meals. They gave thanks for the wonderful food and for all their blessings. They made sure that no problems, worries, or arguments entered into their table conversation. Third step, prayer before rest. They kept their Bible close at hand and read a selection from it each night before going to sleep. These included the 23rd, 27th, and 91st Psalms, the 11th chapter of Hebrews, and the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. 
They said quietly, Thank you, Father, for all the blessings of this day. God giveth his beloved sleep. Both Bill and Janet made a private vow to stop doing the things that created distance from the other. This took discipline plus an intense desire on both sides to make their marriage work. As they followed this practical procedure, harmony eventually was restored to them. The couple was reunited. I had a rather strange interview a few years ago with Dwayne R. and Margie B., who came to see me at my hotel in Dallas, Texas. They were both worried and anxious. We used to be married, Dwayne told me. To each other, I mean. Then we broke up. I was a stupid, pig-headed mule, or it wouldn't have happened. That's not fair, Margie protested. I acted like an idiot, and you know it. Well, we won't even fight over that now, Dwayne said. The point is, after going round and round, we got divorced. Before long, we both got married again. You've heard about marrying on the rebound, Margie asked. Well, that's what it was. Talk about making a mistake as big as all outdoors. The worst part is I knew before a week was out. Me too, Dwayne said. Anyway, the point is, we tried to fight this thing for the last year and a half, and it's not working. We realize that we still love each other. What do we do? Which do you think is more in accord with God's plan? I asked. A real marriage built on love or a sham marriage built on lies? A real marriage, they both said in the same breath. Then you have your answer, I said. To live a lie with your present spouses is not just or fair to them or to yourselves. You must tell them the truth. I think you will find that on some level they know it already. Dwayne and Margie were able to allow the inner love for one another in their hearts to lead them back to the altar of love. The rebound marriages were dissolved amicably, and all those involved were blessed thereby. The couple was reunited. Love binds two hearts together, and it is an indissoluble link. What therefore God, love, hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Matthew 19.6 The Transforming Power of Love Elizabeth Y. came to me deeply distressed. Do you believe that my father can use mental powers to destroy my marriage? She asked. I'm not sure I understand the question, I replied. Can you tell me more about the situation? She took a deep breath. I've been married for almost a year and a half. Frank and I are deeply in love and very happy. The problem is Frank is a Catholic and my dad hates Catholics. He says they are enslaved to Satan. I know he is praying for my marriage to fall apart and I am terrified that his prayers will work. Prayers do work, don't they? Isn't that what you teach? Well, yes and no, I said. Your prayers can work for you, but your father has no more power over you than a rabbit's foot or a pebble from a rocky shore, unless you grant him that power. If you listen and believe that he can destroy your marriage, his work is already half done. But if you use your own thoughts and feelings to strengthen your marriage, your father will be helpless to combat it. At my suggestion, Elizabeth began to pray frequently that just as God's love had united her with her husband in the beginning, his love would continue to unite them now, surrounding them and enfolding them. She affirmed regularly that the beauty, love, and harmony of God permeated their minds and hearts and that God's love ruled their lives. She realized that nothing could come between her and the man she loved. Love is of the heart. As this young husband and wife found love, grace, and goodwill in one another and saw the virtues of each other, their marriage grew more blessed every day. The young woman prayed for divine understanding for her father, and she told me recently that he was becoming more tolerant now and was learning to love her husband. Prayer transformed a criminal. I once visited a man, Josh B., who was dying from the effects of chronic alcoholism. He told me that his drinking had led him to commit many crimes. What do you think, he asked. Will God punish me? Am I on my way to hell? God is a loving God, I replied. He punishes no one, but we, by our misuse of the laws of life, punish ourselves, either through ignorance or by willfully violating the laws of harmony, love, and right action. You must forgive yourself and let God's love enter your soul. If you resolve to be a new man in God, then the past will be wiped out and remembered no more. We prayed together. Afterward, Josh appeared radiant and happy. The reason for this was that he now had a deep inner faith and conviction that he was on the right side of God and that all was forgiven. He was very relaxed and said he was ready for what he called heaven. His doctor noticed a remarkable improvement in the man and soon thereafter he was told he would live 
Indeed, within 10 days, he left the hospital, whole and healthy again. Josh is now 85 years old, still strong and healthy. He has become wonderful, upright, godlike man, completely transformed. How did all this come about? It was the result of his acceptance of the truth about God. His complete surrender of all his crimes, hates, and guilt immediately released his mind and body. His body responded in a miraculous manner to his new mental attitude. His inner sense of freedom and peace of mind. Nothing else was the healing agent. Prayer saved his life. I was visiting a friend in the hospital as I got up to leave. He urged me to talk to the man in the next bed, Robert C. He told me in a whisper that Robert was on the critical list, the widespread systematic infection that did not respond to antibiotics. He was not expected to live. I introduced myself to Robert. He seemed glad to have a distraction. As we talked about the hospital, he suddenly said, The worst part of being here is that I know Harry is gloating like anything. I loathe that man. They don't come any lower than him. Who is he? I asked. He was my partner, Robert told me. Then I found out he was cooking the books and diverting the company's assets. I barely managed to avoid bankruptcy as a result. I tell you what, if I ever get out of this hospital bed, he'd better watch himself. I just might get around to giving him what he deserves. It was easy to see that Robert's loathing had become a festering psychic wound. Would you invite your former partner to dinner, I asked. Only if I knew I could get away with poisoning him, he declared. Yet you entertain him constantly in your mind, I pointed out. And it is not he who is being poisoned, it is you. You give him, or rather your psychic image of him, immense power over your mind, your body, and your vital organs. You are the only thinker in your universe. That means you are directly responsible for the thoughts, concepts, and images that come to you. If you saturate your mind with hatred and loathing, the effects will surely make themselves known in your body. But if you saturate your mind with the truths of God, only wholeness and health can follow. Before leaving, I gave Robert a prayer to meditate on, which makes up the next section of this chapter. I later heard that he had made a rapid and unexpected recovery from his infection. True wonders happen as you pray. The power of God. This prayer has helped many people to transform their lives. As you meditate on these wonderful truths, you too will shortly discover that wonders are happening in your life. God is the only presence and the only power, and I am one with it. God's strength is my strength. His intelligence floods my mind. This new awareness gives me complete dominion in every department of my life. I'm now joined to the one universal mind, which is God. His wisdom, power, and glory flow through me. I know that the energy and power of God permeate every atom, tissue, muscle, and bone of my being, making me perfect now. God is life, and this life is my life. My faith is renewed. My vitality is restored. God walks and talks in me. He is my God. I am one with Him. His truth is my shield and buckler. I rejoice that it is so. Under His wings shall I trust. I dwell in the secret place of the Most High, and I abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Points to remember. 1. Hatred is a mental poison. Forgiveness and love are the spiritual antidotes to use, and then a healing follows. 2. Get a new concept of God as love. Realize that God is for you, not against you. 3. Your mental attitude is cause, and your experience is effect. 4. You can protect yourself from all harm by realizing that God's love surrounds you, enfolds you, and enwraps you. 5. Believe in your heart the truths expounded in the 91st Psalm and you will be invulnerable. 6. Imagine and feel that you are loved, wanted, and appreciated, and you will never lack friends. 7. Pray for the so-called special child by calling forth in prayer and meditation the intelligence and wisdom of God which are inherent in all children. 8. Mentally write your freedom in your subconscious mind and it will respond accordingly. 9. Your real belief about God determines your whole fate. 10. 
Your belief about God is your real belief about yourself. Man is belief expressed. Quimby. 11. Your normal belief about God is meaningless. What really matters is the belief in your heart. 12. Believe that God is all bliss, peace, beauty, joy, and love. And what is true of God is true of you. Make a habit of this, and wonders will happen in your life. 13. Boldly claim that God supplies all your needs, and you will prosper in all your ways. 14. Your habitual fears can be communicated to the subconscious of your spouse. Form a habit of thinking on that which is lovely and of good report. 15. When God's love unites a husband and wife, no person, place, or condition can break up the marriage. Love is the indissoluble link that binds. 16. God or life punishes no one. We punish ourselves, either through ignorance or by willfully violating the laws of harmony, love, and right action. 17. Hatred is a deadly poison, causing the death of all the vital organs of the body. Now, this is a beautiful chapter that so powerfully summarizes the key teachings of Joseph Murphy. If you or a friend or family member is suffering from some sickness like cancer, talk to them. Are they holding a hatred about somebody in particular or a thing in their lives? I can tell you this from personal experience. My own mother, who died of colon cancer, did this very thing. She felt fears and angers and hatred for a number of people, and it all manifested in her body. And I promise you, if you have somebody in your life that's struggling with this, there is a mental cause. And oftentimes, as we see in a couple of the stories here, it's some person they have not forgiven. So if you can learn to pray on this, it will change your life. And if you're struggling in finding love, it's your own concept of yourself that is doing it. You can change that by changing the way you view yourself subconsciously. Also, it affects the people around you as the story of the person with his son. If you're judging your kids by saying they're no good, they never do what they need to do, then you're going to see that in your kids. I think that this is an epidemic. People's kids start to struggle. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Change the way you view your friends or your kids and watch how they change in your world. They might fail at something. Something might come up. But remember, it works in the same way as it does for yourself as it does for others. The way that you imagine them is the way they become. So if your son or daughter is struggling, imagine that they're not. Imagine that this is just a part of the process towards their true brilliance. Or imagine that it is working to their advantage, and it will. You know that anything is possible. If you're struggling with something that you're terrified about, and you are going to be shot as the person from Japan in the story said, then pray that you are a child of God and that God cannot shoot yourself or God cannot do whatever and punish yourself. And it is such a powerful belief, this idea of God. Your understanding of God will affect everything. If you believe that God is punishing you, God will punish you. Your belief of God is your life. So if you believe that God is loving, powerful, intelligent, and a loving parent to you, then it is amazing the way these things change. Now, he points out several Psalms, and he's a big believer in reading those Psalms, and, and it definitely works. There is no doubt. But the big thing from this is believe that God is love, that he watches over you and cares for you, and that he guides and prospers and loves you, and wonders will happen in your life that will far exceed your fondest dreams. And that is what I want for you. It's such a simple teaching, but I promise your relationships with others, your experiences in your life, the things you're going through have all been determined by these beliefs, by the relationships you have, and by your understanding of God.
And if you change this and embrace the idea that God is love and forgive those around you and reimagine those people that you think are your enemies and imagine them as your friends and reimagine the problems that your friends or kids are struggling with, you can change the world. You alone can change the world by the way you imagine. And now is the time to start. Power of love will transform your life. God is the only presence and the only power, and you are one with it. His strength is your strength. His intelligence is flooding your mind now. I'd love to get your thoughts on this. If you're like me, sometimes Joseph Murphy is the perfect antidote to whatever you're struggling with. It's a reminder, such a simple teaching every time, but it's so transformative and so powerful. So in any case, please put a comment about how these thoughts have changed your mind. Have you had experiences that are similar to these stories? Did you hate somebody and did you struggle with your health and then forgiving someone else? Then it changed. Your stories are important. People are going to read these comments and your stories are very important because people want to see an example of these teachings in the real world. So please share your stories. Put a like on this because people need to know this truth that God is love and that this powerful concept will change the world. In any case, all episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution. Revolution.